Welcome aboard Delta Airlines. Please enjoy your flight and thanks for choosing Delta. Jody Avergan here. Thanks for listening to ESPN Films 30 for 30 podcasts from the producers of the award-winning 30 for 30 series. These new audio documentaries are an incredible collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. It's really a win-win. Delta Airlines makes your travel experience easy and enjoyable with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And ESPN's 30 for 30 podcasts make your in-flight time rich with stories that will keep you coming back for more. So sit back, relax, and keep listening to some of the most compelling sports stories ever told. Looks like the Celtics are done hoarding, question mark. Ugh. The Knicks front office is looking unpresidential. Oh, thank you. And the Sixers, they just need their fans to look away. No. Specifically away from Mark Russell's yes. oh. It's Around the Horn, the show of competitive banter. Welcome back to Around the Horn. I am Pablo Torre filling in for Tony Reale, who is baby driving in the most literal sense. But first, it's the first word. So before he got Gordon Hayward, Danny Ainge was that guy who kept holding at the poker table. But now it looks like the Celtics GM may be playing his cards right. Avery Bradley and Kelly Olynyk are out. But Hayward and Jason Tatum and Aaron Baines are in. Not to mention all those draft picks, those assets that Haynes was still hoarding. So Jackie, how big a threat is this Celtics team going to be? Well, I would call them a developing threat, Pablo, because Hmm. I don't think the Celtics are done yet. And the reason I say that is you bring in Gordon Haywood, who was the free agent, coveted free agent prize that they were hoping to get. They beat out Miami for it. But they still have Jay Crowder on the roster, and so much of their skill set is a bit redundant, except for Gordon Haywood's probably better at every single thing. So why is Jay Crowder still on the roster? He has a really very friendly contract, three years left at around $7.0 a little more than that. And what you use him for is to land that big one, Pablo, because everybody likes Jay Crowder and they like his contract. So you combine those picks perhaps down the road for that one last big piece, which would have been Paul George if the Pacers hadn't panicked and traded him too soon to OKC. (laughs) We're going to get to Paul George in a second, Jackie. But, J.A., you look at this team now, and are you as forward-thinking as Jackie is, or is there something that this team can do this coming season? No, because there's still not that piece out there that gives them one of the five best players in the league. They got better, certainly. They added Gordon Hayward, more scoring, uh, you know, another scoring threat. Isaiah Thomas doesn't have to handle that all by himself anymore. But it does cost you. You lose Avery Bradley, so your best perimeter defender. Who's going to guard Kyrie Irving and John Wall? And, and Jackie mentioned Jay Crowder. I think that's a good guy to throw up against LeBron James. Do you want to lose him and lose the guy that can defend, not stop, but that can defend LeBron James? And it's interesting. I read a story that said this helps the Celtics close the gap on the Cavaliers. It's not often you hear about a team closing the gap on a team that finished behind it during the regular season standings. But, of course, we know this is all about playoffs and can they get out of the Eastern Conference and right now they are not better than LeBron when he wants to turn it on as he does every postseason. So Tim if this is about LeBron as it always is what does this get the Celtics? Well I mean it gets them a lot closer. I I think they're closer than J.A. says just because I don't think Cleveland is likely to be the same Cleveland. I know I've said this before and I've been wrong. I don't think I need to be penalized for this. LeBron is not always going to (laughs) go to the NBA Finals. That streak is it seven? Uh, I don't think it's going to get to ten. The question is, is will it get to eight? And, and will Cleveland and, and all their parts play at that same level in the playoffs they got to this year after having a very frustrating finals with, with Golden State? I, I don't know that Cleveland can do that. I think Boston has clearly gotten better. And the main thing they've done, everybody makes fun of Danny H for hanging on to those assets, but he does still have them. So moving forward, they do have more cards to play. So a point for the cards to play, Tim, but a mute from the future and you doubting LeBron James. KB, join us. Well, Danny Ainge is still sitting at the poker table, but I thought a few weeks ago that 
he would have pushed in enough chips to get not only Gordon Hayward, but also to land, as Jackie mentioned, Paul mm -hmm. George. He wasn't able to do that, so this team is not appreciably better um, right now, especially after le losing um, Avery. And, of course, Wizards fans are glad to see Kelly Olynyk leave as well. Um, so I don't know that they made any move, and it seems to me that the one thing they're hoping for is, is maybe that Cleveland will not be able to quickly reconstruct its roster uh, to fill the holes and the gaps that it clearly has, and that maybe they can make up some room that way. But right now, I don't, I don't think so. And I, I think this is just uh, the jury is still out to see what's going to happen to all those other picks. So, Jackie, you know Danny Ainge as well as anybody. He is waiting out LeBron. Is that the, the plan here going forward? Wait until that guy retires? Pablo, he's waiting it out to, till he makes the deal that he wants to make. Danny Ainge doesn't care about what any of us thinks, what KB thinks, what anybody else thinks. <laughs> he's going to do what he thinks that makes his team best. Now, here's the thing. There's a good shot that, we, and you know this too, that LeBron may bolt for the Lakers a year from now. Sure. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, who's the favorite in the East? And let's take an even longer view, Pablo. You've got Jason Tatum, who's a teenager. Jalen Brown, who's a teenager. You have Brooklyn's number one pick next year, which I guarantee you will be top five. And... If everything breaks right, if the Lakers' pick falls between two and five, you get their pick, too. You tell me any other team in the NBA that wouldn't want to be the Boston Celtics right now. Dale Besides the Warriors. <laughs> Jalen Brown, technically 20, one. Jackie, but I want to ask you real quick. Isaiah Thomas saying the Celtics got to bring out the Brinks truck for him. Are they going to pay that guy what he wants? Yeah, I think that's why Avery Bradley's gone, because they couldn't pay both, and they've chosen to pay IT. Mm. Jay, back in. Well, it's not a new comment. He's made that clear before, and, and at some sure. point he's going to have to be rewarded for what he's done for this franchise. He helped bring it to this stage to make it more attractive for Gordon Hayward. You first need to get the guys in place and develop them and have them uh, create a good environment that's going to attract free agents. Isaiah Thomas did it. He should be rewarded. Tim, back in. If the Celtics' biggest problem is figuring out how much to pay a guy who scored 50 in the playoffs, that's not that big of a problem. <laughs> We talked about Paul George near the top of that segment. We want to get into it now because he wanted to trade Indy for L.A. and more or less let everybody know it. But Oklahoma City, of course, swooped in and got him for an Oladipo and a Sabonis. And actually, that is it. Oladipo and Sabonis for Paul George, period. And now Russell Westbrook's solo act becomes something of a duo. Tim, you're our flyover country correspondent. Thank you. What does George do for the Thunder in this Western Conference? But he does a lot. I, I think he moves them uh, way up. And, and I've said before, I might have tweeted this, that I'll take, I'll take uh, Russell Westbrook and Paul George and some stuff over Chris Paul and James Harden and some <laughs> stuff. But in general, if you want to say, who, who's the guy that's most like Kevin Durant? He's not quite as tall, but he, but he also shoots 37% from threes, mm -hmm. scores in the 20s, can defend really well when he chooses to. That would be Paul George. So I think they can move back to looking something like they did uh, you know, a year before, I'm not saying they're going to go play a seven-game conference finals with Golden State, but I think they're very good, and uh, if they're good enough and do well enough in the playoffs, I think they have ways to encourage George uh, to stick around. KB, is that how you see it? We got a diet Kevin Durant now paired up with uh, Russell Westbrook. This is this is a great move on so many levels. First, how about the fan base, right? Which which had to suffer through the loss of Kevin Durant, as as did Westbrook. And you know what, Presty says, I'm not going to leave you folks hanging. And Westbrook, all you did for us last year, leading us to 47 wins with that squad, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to go out and get the best that I can. He goes out and gets Paul George, and he doesn't stop there. He goes out and gets Patrick uh, Patterson, um, Peterson. Um, to, to bring him in, who was fabulous when he was with the Raptors. They were a plus 1,004 1, with him on the floor, minus 38 without him. The guy can stretch the floor and play a little D for you, too. And you know what? The other big thing was when, they went, when Westbrook had to sit last year, they had nothing. The point guard position just fell apart. And now, you know, they bring in a guy like Felton and – what he brings is at least some veteran leadership. He should be able to hold that point guard down for a few minutes on the floor and not have the team go into the tank during that time. Some good stats, KB, but a cleanup in aisle. Patterson, Patterson. that was the Peter we were looking for. And, Jackie, please join us. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised Toronto let Patterson get away. Those numbers are pretty amazing. I, I do think it makes sense to make this gamble. I give Sam Presti a lot of credit for doing it. It didn't cost him that much, Pablo. Oladipo didn't fit well with Westbrook. He had kind of a lousy year, honestly. I'm not saying his career is over, but this made sense on so many levels. And if you could convince him to stay, fine. If, at the very least, maybe you convince Westbrook to re-up. 
And isn't that almost as good? So you've got all sorts of things going here for you. And if for some reason both of them go, you're in position for rebuild. This was a win-win all the way for OKC. J.A. I love the risk, even though it didn't cost them that much. You know, it wasn't key foundational pieces that they had to give up. Uh, such a low return for Indiana it makes you wonder if some of the other rumored deals that were out there were actually tangible offers that were being made, such as some of the offers supposedly coming out of Boston, Jackie. But J.A., do you see Paul George potentially rejecting L.A. and your town and staying in OKC after this year? You never know. It reminds me of Mark McGuire when he got traded to, to St. Louis from the Oakland A's and people were wondering, oh, is he just going to be a rental? And he fell in love with the place and the atmosphere there, and he stayed there, you know, the rest of his playing days. So maybe something similar happens with Paul George. Maybe they get a winning environment and he's happy there. And he can still come to L.A. in the summers. It's not like L.A. is off limits to him. I was going to say, there is the homerism that we've known and come to love from Jay Adande. <laughs> but let's get to the Frank Isola fever dream now. That is Madison Square Garden. Because former Cavs GM David Griffin has pulled himself out of the ongoing search for Knicks president. While acting GM Steve Mills has offered $71 million over four to Tim Hardaway the Younger. Phil Jackson, meanwhile, he just wants you to see his cankles. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Jay, are you surprised that the Knicks did not want to cede control to one David Griffin? No, I'm not surprised because it's the New York Knicks. This is what they do. This is Dolan being Dolan, and you're never going to see them succeed as long as he is the owner. This is a classic example of thinking that you know more than the guy whose team just went to the finals three straight years. And yes, LeBron was there in Cleveland, but David Griffin did a good job of surrounding him with the necessary components to make them championship contenders despite being restricted by, by uh, the severe salary cap. They, they were hampered on the salary cap. He still managed to navigate within that. So he had every right to make demands coming in. He's done more than the Knicks have done recently. They should have listened to him and ceded his demands. Tim, join us. You know, I, I think the sad part here is that it sounds like the Knicks uh, said no to David Griffin because of the idea. Yeah, we, we tried that once. We gave a guy control, and right? it didn't work. The problem <laughs> is you gave a guy who was great at coaching superstars but had never done anything like building a team from scratch control, and he didn't know what he was doing, and I, I don't know if he even cared what he was doing, doing. David Griffin would be a very different thing, but if they want to give – 71 million to Tim Hardaway, they may be going a different direction anyway. Yeah, KB, that seems like an obstacle towards getting a new president general manager is you handicapping him with $71 million of Tim Hardaway Jr. Yeah, well, I don't think it's Tim Hardaway Jr. It's back to what J.A. said. It is the owner since mm. 1999. Look at the lack of success that this team has had. Look at how the New York Knicks have become a laughing stock and no longer a cornerstone, a foundation, um, one of the emblematic teams of the NBA. It is the owner's problem. It's not these other contracts, although these were done before you get a GM. That, too, is part of the problem. So this starts from high up. This is not something to do with the with what's going on in the middle of this of, of this uh, this ownership and this management it comes from the head guy Jackie? Yeah, and you know what David Griffin I'm glad in a way this fell through for him he is a great GM if he had played, gone for this owner he would have been 0 for 2 with people that actually appreciate his skill set he's going to get another job remember there were three other teams that wanted to hire them and the Cleveland Cavaliers wouldn't even let him go talk to them. So believe me, he'll get a job in due time. It might actually be a three-owner scenario for David Griffin. Jackie, if you go back to Robert Sarver and the Phoenix Suns, who's its oh, own story for point. another, another segment. Because that was your horn, and here is your break. And we'll talk about not Phil Jackson in the next segment, probably. Maybe. More photos may come out in between now and then, actually. I retract that. Around the Horn is brought to you by Liberty Mutual Insurance. Liberty stands with you. Buy or sell. Welcome back and welcome to baseball's all-star break. J.A.'s Dodgers and Tim's Astros are on cruise control at 61 and 60 wins, respectively. Both teams are almost 10 games clear of second place in their league. So, J.A., which team is the bigger lock to reach the World Series, or do you want to pencil them both in right now? Well, I'm going with the Dodgers, uh, the biggest run differential at the break since I was born. And recency bias alert, I was out at Dodger Stadium yesterday, and the confidence in Chavez Ravine, from manager Dave Roberts to the ushers and security guards who've been working there for decades. You've got Clayton Kershaw, as good as he's ever been. You can get runs from anywhere in the lineup. Justin Turner, two runs yesterday. This looks like a World Series team to me. 
You just cited ushers and security. J.A., that is a mute by definition. Tim. I love the Astros uh, lineup every day. They lead the majors in run scoring, slugging percentage, and they have the fewest strikeouts. Whoever does that. But they do have a question mark with Dallas Keuchel. There's no question about Clayton Kershaw. He's the greatest pitcher of this generation. He's eventually going to win that NLCS game he needs to win. And so I would lean a little bit because of that toward the Dodgers. Classic Tim Kalashaw, champion your team before undercutting it completely. KB. <laughs> well, I would lean a little bit more towards the Astros just because I think their road to getting to the World Series is not as stacked as it is for the Dodgers uh, coming out of the uh, National League. I mean, I saw the Dodgers uh, play against the Nationals earlier this year when they lost uh, two or three in their house and should have gotten swept had it not been for a weird ending to that game um, when, uh, when the Nationals couldn't somehow get Trey Turner home from third base with nobody out. Um, so I would go with the Astros right now as a surefire. But who is counting, KB? Jackie, please clean us up. So I've always been told by, by my friend Bill Plasky, never believe in the Dodgers. Now every day I pick up the paper, Bill Plasky's telling me the Dodgers are going to win it all. I don't know. It's I'm over. very, very, very confused. So I'm going to stick with the Astros. As, as Tim mentioned, they're averaging 5.2 runs a game. They're also in the top four defensively. If Keuchel, They're doing this without Keuchel, Tim. They're doing it without Colin McHugh. Imagine if those guys get healthy, what's going to happen. And they're batting 298 on the road, Pablo. Give it to me. I want That's how you get points. Just trash Bill Plasky when he's nowhere to be found. <laughs> but speaking, speaking of the future, the process trusters the were tested Marty. yet again when Markel Fultz went down with a high ankle strain in Summer League Saturday night. A few flashbacks to Embiid and to Simmons and to Okafor. Your Philadelphia Sisyphus errs. See what I did there? And earlier that same day, there was Embiid also getting fined a cool 10K for saying, and I quote, bleep LeVar Ball on Instagram. Tim, what are you buying and selling from all that this weekend? I'm, I'm buying that everything is okay in Philadelphia. Sixers fans need to relax. They don't need Markel Fultz to really do anything for three months. And this was a minor injury. They beat Golden State. Hey, just take that for what it is. <laughs> it, it might be the last time that happens for two or three years, but enjoy the ride. That is an expert spin, KB. I'm buying that Fools will be okay. It's fine to shut him down. This is part of the process. It's about, it's not necessarily about results right now. Isn't that right? Um, and the other thing is, uh, I'm selling the league fining Embiid for his remark on Instagram. Stay off of Instagram, NBA. Good grief. Jackie? I am buying the Sixers for sure, but I am also buying the idea that if you're a Sixers fan and every time a player goes down, you go like this. Do you realize since 2015, their number one pick have been on the court for a total of 53 games, Pablo, and all 53 of them were Jalil Okafor. None from Noel, none from Simmons, none from Embiid. No wonder Brett Brown says we're punch drunk on injuries. He's right. It's a very good stat, but that is for the first season that they had. So a little bit more hope. J.A., is there any hope in your forecast for this team? There, there is some hope, and that's why, Jackie, I'll, I'll sell the notion that they should panic over Fultz's injury. He seems like he's okay, but by the notion that these guys have to prove that they can withstand the rigors of NBA basketball. They can get on the court in the first place to withstand the rigors of NBA basketball, so that still remains a mysterious element of the process. But as for the son of the subject of said Instagram video we just talked about, Lonzo Ball is doing Lonzo Ball things face planting in his summer league debut and then triple doubling in game two so kb you're the professor what grade do you give lonzo after his first two quizzes in summer league uh i give him a c right uh so he was obviously got an f in the first one closer to an a in the second one with the triple double so that would work out to a c look i'm just amazed that NBA summer ball has become what it's become. We're analyzing everybody, trying to project <laughs> what they look, what they're going to look like against the big boys playing against guys just like them. How dare you allege that there is no real news going on today, KB? Jackie. <laughs> I think Lonzo Ball did exactly what we thought he was going to do. The one thing we heard, Pablo, was we weren't 100% sure how well he could shoot the three. He's proven in two games, only two, small sample size, that maybe that's an issue. But his court vision, he's sitting there playing in front of Magic Johnson, who used to throw no-look passes that would hit Jamal Wilkes off the head. He's doing the same thing with his own teammates. It's awesome. Yeah, and the ball got out of his hands so quickly. That's what stood out to me. Forget about the shooting percentages. Everybody got so hyped by Brandon Ingram's 26 points in his summer league return this year. He was 3 for 12 against the Sixers last year in his first time through summer league. So the grade is an incomplete because we don't know enough about these guys. Yet. <laughs> Tim? 
The grade is a D when you're shooting 25%, and that was the cheapest of triple doubles, 11, 11, 11. Why didn't you just get 10, 10, 10? Well, Barely scraping by. Unfortunately, Mr. Kalashop, Professor Blackstone, we do not grade on a curve here, which means that you guys happen to be eliminated, and we have Adande and McMullen in Showdown next. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this, um... Five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay, judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. So do you want to know the awful truth, or do you want to see Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stan and Cody Bellinger sock a few dingers? The Derby's tonight, Jay. Who you got? I got to go with Aaron Judge. Great ESPN.com article today that basically said he's, he has the best numbers across the board. You look at exit velocity, launch angle, and all the in vogue stats. Aaron Judge is your guy. Here's the only stat you need to know about Aaron Judge. It's this, J.A., one every ten at-bats. It's really that simple, my friend. That's the stat that matters. The more at-bats, the less at-bats for the more home runs. There's no at-bats. You guys don't need to stat shame each other. They were both good stats. We move on. Some alarming news for the people of Pittsburgh. Tom Brady has touched your cup. I repeat, Tom Brady has touched your cup. Jackie, is this kosher given Brady's history with Pittsburgh? Well, really, I don't know why Pittsburgh, they should be upset with the Penguins owner that let Tom Brady touch the cup. We all know you're not supposed to touch the Stanley Cup unless you win it. But you know what? He's 10-3 nope. and three against the Pittsburgh Steelers, 3-0 and oh in the playoffs. Good number. Jackie, the no t- cup touching thing only goes for if you're playing in the NHL. I've touched the cup. I'm not anywhere near an NHL hockey player. But it's not the Penguins' cup. It's not Pittsburgh's cup. That's what makes the trophy so great. It's a permanent trophy. Your name's on the cup. It doesn't belong to you. It's not their cup. You know, Jay raises a good J-A, point. But... It's a good point, but totally eliminated by humble bragging about touching the cup. Really, man? Jackie McMullen, too. So you might have noticed that I'm a little competitive, and you might wonder where that came from. And it's from a guy named Fred McMullen, who turns 92 years old this week. Dad played football. He played yeah. basketball at a pretty high level. And then he got older, and he played a lot of golf. They go to him and they tell him, Fred, you got trigger finger. You need very serious surgery, so we're going to advise you give up golf. My dad says, oh, no, nothing to do. I talked to him last week. He says, Jackie, guess what? I just joined a cornhole league. I'm telling you, man, <laughs> 92 years old. Keep going, Dad. Happy birthday. Trigger finger. That is wonderful. And your dad can play me in Mario Kart, Jackie. That's going to do it, folks. Mario. Mario. We're going to have our break. Happy birthday, Dad.